Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of To Whom It May Concern. I'm your host, Malak, here with my co-hosts, Inara, Fawaila, and Maryam. Hey. So today's episode of To Whom It May Concern is extra special because we have an inspirational guest with us. She attended Loyola University at Chicago, where she graduated with a degree in journalism and international studies. She made her on-air debut in 2018 with WHBF-TV and is currently working with the NBC in Austin Network. Not only has she fulfilled her dream of becoming a TV news reporter, but she's the first full-time news reporter with hijab on, on American News. She's especially a role model to the modern skeptics and sisters everywhere trying to make it on social media. With <laughs> us today is none other than Tahira Rahman. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me and uh, Jazakallah for such a nice little introduction. <laughs> Thank you for coming. For coming of on. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to have you and to hear more about your journey and how you became a news reporter. So, Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we're just kind of going to jump right into it, Tahira. Um, and we just kind of want to hear your background story on how you've come to be who you are today um, and just your journey into getting on the news with hijab on, some of the challenges that you faced, why you pursued it so hard, like why you were so driven to pursue it, especially that it's so uncommon um, between Muslims and hijabis um, especially. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's like... Oh my gosh, we could talk about this forever. Um, <laughs> because it's funny, the reason why I got into journalism in particular was just because I think the storytelling aspect really drew me in. Ever since I was little, I loved to write. And like, it's funny because I'd have like pages of notebook paper around the house and I just write these like really dumb stories, but I thought <laughs> that they were so good at the time, you know? And I was like, and I, I just remember thinking that I was just going to be this like novelist. Um, but then as I grew older, it, it uh, grew to be more of uh, like reality informed writing. And so it was especially after 9-11 where you kind of, everyone kind of knows, especially my age, where you can tell pre and post 9-11 life. Um, and it's very different. And so I was in fifth grade and I'm really dating myself now <laughs> like now you guys know how old I am um but I remember thinking even that young watching the news how skewed I thought it was and how sad it made me um, and made me feel really helpless too as a Muslim girl that they were portraying people who looked like me my family members who had my beliefs in such a negative light and kind of grouping us all, lumping us all together, you know? And I remember thinking that like, oh, I, I specifically remember thinking if I were the one talking on the news, I don't have to say that. I can change that. Yeah. And so it's like this very naive way of thinking of news, obviously, because that's not, it's not that cut and dry, but um, that's kind of what led me to start thinking about it at a young age. And then obviously in college, I started taking courses um, and I love the aspect of it. And uh, with my internships, between my internship and my classes, I realized that TV was really my passion because I loved all the different elements that went along with it. Um, I did a digital internship with Al Jazeera English in, in Qatar, and that helped me rule out the, um, the digital aspect of it because I realized you could write a whole story and not even leave the office. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call everyone. And I didn't like that. I wanted to be in the field. I wanted to be face to face with people and talking to them and meeting them, learning about them. And that's what I loved about TV is you have to go get that video. You have to talk to them in person. And that's the harder part of it because people freak out when they see a camera. But um, in the end, I felt like it was more rewarding. And then you get to be in control of a full story. Like you get to... Um, from start to finish, the idea to the video to editing it and scripting it and getting it on air, that's all yours. And so I love that aspect of it. Um, and come fast forward to senior year of college at Loyola, when I decided and committed to really pursuing that as a career, uh, that's when you kind of realize the reality of it and how difficult it's going to be. And 
I heard it from my internship uh, producer um, at CBS. I internship I interned at CBS Evening News Bureau in Chicago, and the producer there, Ryan asked me point blank, he was like, if you got your dream job offer, let's say with CNN, you were going to be a correspondent on there, everything you wanted, but they asked you to take off your hijab, would you do it? And it was, I'm glad he asked me that early on, um, because I knew that my answer was no, I would not do that. And he said, okay, just get ready for a lot of no's. So he told me right off the bat, it was going to be hard. And it's not necessarily that he said it was impossible or that I shouldn't do it. He was just letting me know like, hey, hey kid, I've been in this industry a really long time. I'm just letting you know it's gonna be hard. And so I'm glad he told me that. And it really put me in the mindset of like, okay, I know I'm gonna experience a lot of like rejection, um, but inshallah, I can make it because why not? Like, yeah. why can't we do this? Like there was no logical explanation to me besides, yeah, it might be weird to a news director to put a hijabi on air. It's different. It's a risk. It's, it is a risk because when someone sees my hijab on, in their living room on TV, it, they have a lot of connotations with this. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of baggage and news directors know and I'm not naive to think otherwise that yeah like you're gonna have to overcome that and so um I just decided to pursue it I did get a lot of no's <laughs> I for let's see I graduated 2013 and I didn't get on here till 2018 so for five years I pursued Hello. it um yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, like, what kept you going? Like, how did you, tr like, stay true? Like, did you question, like, maybe I should, maybe there'd be a greater good, at least to have a Muslim still on there? Is it, you know, like, how do you stay strong to your Muslim identity and just, like, I'm going to stick with this? You know, I think it was a combination of different things. One is that, first of all, my mom, um, <laughs> she's such a big supporter, and she's, she's like, my rock, and um, even when I felt like I was at my lowest, it was, I, I felt like I was the closest to having a reporting job. And then I got rejected again. And I remember I was just sitting there crying in my car on my way home from work. Cause I was already a producer at the station that I had applied at three times to be oh. a reporter. Um, and everyone loved me. And like, they always talked about my work ethic. I was coming in on weekends to help reporters like that was my off time but I wanted to make sure I still knew how to write I still knew how to edit and shoot a camera and everything on my own time and so I just felt so demoralized after that and my mom kept me going and she said that you know if you don't keep trying you're always going to regret it for the rest of your life you know this is what you want to do and inshallah there's good in it you know there's there's good in this journey there's a purpose in it so you know, you can cry right now, but get back up and you're going to apply the next time an opening becomes available. And so that really helped me to have that support. And then obviously my faith, um, because I knew that even if this job wasn't good for me, something better would come. And so that is just what I kept, even when I didn't feel it necessarily or believe it in my head, I just kept saying it. And like, literally there were nights where I would just, after Salah, I would just cry and I would just like make extra dua. And I would just like, I'm crying right now thinking about it. <laughs> uh, I'm just like, I, cause I, I would think like, y'all if this isn't for me. If this isn't my path, if this isn't my fate, my destiny, then just put it far from my heart and please give me something much better and let me find purpose in something else then mm -hmm. and fulfillment. And so I, that's, that's what got me through it. And I was just, just like day by day, take it one step at a time, get better at what you do observe, like be critical of yourself. That's what I was telling myself and just try to always get better to the point where they can't, you know, they can't pass you up. Like you're, you're better than any other candidate. And so the last thing left is your hijab and you just have to address it. You have to talk about it at that point. So that's what I did. And um, that last rejection that I had gotten from my station, that's afterwards. I kind of took a couple days, breather, came back to work, obviously still produce like 
the nine and ten o'clock newscast or whatever newscast I was that, doing that day. You said it with the same company after they rejected you. I did, yeah. And I e and I emailed management. I emailed my news director, and he forwarded it to like the general manager who owns the station because he liked it so much. But I told him like I respect your decision. Obviously, you know I'm not going to question it. But here is why I think I'm the best candidate. And I said basically I've been here. Every single candidate that you have right now is fresh out of college. They don't know this area. They don't know the newsroom. They don't know the key players, the mayors, everything like that, which I do. Um, and I feel like, honestly, I'm not flourishing as much as I can here. I'm not growing as much as I can, and you're missing an opportunity. But having said all that, let me know what I can do to make sure that next time I'm hired for this position. And so they basically told me, they kind of gave me an easy answer on their part. And they were like, we're not saying no, we're just saying not right now. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. We're noticing what you do, blah, blah, blah. And so I was like, okay, you know, I, I was like, I'll, I'll give them that. That's fine. And, and so um, finally, that last time, like fast forward, <laughs> fast forward, probably like six months after that, um, and the general manager emailed me and he was like, when you come into work today, stop by my office first. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, this I is, can't deal with the same company. The same company. Oh, okay. Uh, I remember passing by one of our anchors desks. Like I put my purse down in my bag and then I was um, just kind of like, you know, when you're like stalling, you're just like talking to everyone in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so she told me, Tiffany, she's like, um, I'm pretty sure Marshall like wanted you in his office. I was like, yeah, I'm going, but I really <laughs> don't want to. And she looked at me. She said, you should go. She's like, it's a good thing. Trust me. And I was like, what does she know that I don't? And so I went there and he offered me the job. And so I was so happy. Like, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Like, obviously Aww. I called my mom right away as soon as I left the <laughs> office. Um, and I found out later that Tiffany was one of maybe three or four people along with our other anchor um, and some of our producers who went to Marshall's office of general, general manager. And they like, after I got rejected from last position and they said, you're making a big mistake. She is the best employee we have in this building and mm -hmm. you're making a mistake if you don't hire her. And I was like, subhanAllah, all that was happening without my knowledge knowledge all of that was happening because other people saw how hard I worked I didn't have to say anything I didn't have to cry about it I didn't have to badmouth anyone and like it, it's so amazing when like you see part of Allah's plan work after the fact mm -hmm. and it just I makes you it. think thank God I never gave up like thank God I kept faith like time and time again that's what gets you through it and it always works out subhanallah yeah. what's really inspirational to me like we kind of mentioned before is your conviction to your values because i know that's something super hard especially in relation to the media and it brings me back to the past where because my mom also worked in like the media sphere but in terms of magazines so it's kind of like a little different but i've seen it with like ads where there would be a lot of places that would like alcohol will give you ten thousand dollars run this in your magazine put this on your website and you had to make those hard decisions and shut that down and truly truly believe that Allah will help you get there as long as you stay to the path and honestly when I heard your story <laughs> I'm not gonna lie I cried so hard because I was so happy that you were able to like, inshallah, you get all the rewards in the next life, but also see the fruits of your effort here and now and inspire so many other people, including us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there aren't that many people that go into newscasting in general, especially as a Muslim. Did you have any mentors or people that guided you through that path? That's a really good question. And I try to bring them up as much as possible, possible because I think that it's important to know the context of everyone's journey and it's not a one person journey right it is a whole every 
thing in your life that leads up to that moment and everyone in your life. So I mentioned my mom, obviously, there are some people in the field um, that were super kind, like, I don't know if you guys know Malika Bilal, she's um, with Al Jazeera, she's on Al Jazeera The Take, which is a podcast now, but she used to be on the stream, she was a co-host, it was like there's a digital news um, a show for them, and so she was an anchor there, and she's based in Washington, D.C., um, and I actually met her because I interned with her at Al Jazeera English way back when I was in college, and so she was always so kind, and like, every time I emailed her, like, this random girl, right, I'm this random girl who, like, is just, like, an obviously a nobody, and I'm just trying to, like, break into this field that no one has really gone to as, like, in my situation with a hijab on, and every time, like, no matter when I, whether it was email or text, or when I was in DC, I asked her if she was able to meet up, all three of those, she was just like, yeah, and she was super sweet, and all gave me such good advice, um, and always told me, for example, like, one of the big issues early on for me was how much do I promote myself on social media, and how much do I let the work speak for itself, and because I'm a journalist first, I'm not an influencer, and so that was a really hard uh, area to navigate, and it still is, there's no easy answer, um, but she was one to tell me, she was just like, you know, I'm, I'm part of the camp where I think your work should speak for itself and like post it on social media and do whatever. But like, for me, there is a line between, you know, like modeling as an, or like doing influencer stuff and getting sponsored and whatever versus journalism and telling the stories in, in, in an unbiased way and like making sure you keep yourself professional. And so I always like have kept that in mind and I appreciated her being candid with me because a lot of, a lot of people don't, they kind of are kind of protective about their um, path. And so I appreciated that there's um, Ramana Hussein, who is an editor at the Chicago Sun Times. She's amazing. She was really good about giving me advice. Um, and then obviously Mariam Silva, I don't know if you guys know her. She's also from the Chicago area. She was on News Radio 780 um, growing up, and I loved hearing her. And she was, we met when we were first invited to do a panel together at Aqsa, which is where I, gra- where I didn't graduate from there, but I went there for a few years. And so um, she actually, for a long time before me, had tried to break into the same market. She was trying to be a TV reporter for much longer than I was. Uh, and so she was so awesome and just like, a very like the definition of women supporting women and I really appreciated that about her because yes snaps to that (laughs) really I really appreciated that because um someone like her could have easily said I have been trying to do this longer than you why should I help you uh why should I give you advice but the kind of character that medium has was so beautiful that she didn't care who it was. She cared about the greater good. And she was like, whoever does it, it's going to be good for us. It's going to be good for our Ummah. It's going to be good for America. And um, she supported it wholeheartedly. And she'd always give me advice as far as like who to talk to and stuff like that. So yeah, those are some of my mentors. I actually went to a talk where Madame Sabah was um, speaking about her experience and she was like similar to your experience how difficult it was to try and like go into that field yeah I wanted to ask um Tahira so I mean TV reporter I feel like is really left field for like I mean I can speak to the Arab community nobody really does TV reporter you don't really hear that people want to pursue um tv so did you face any challenges kind of when you mentioned it to your parents your community the people around you did you feel like you had to constantly explain yourself or that everybody was kind of just not too encouraging of it maybe trying to sway you another way that question can you also describe how you felt navigating the whole system and then being unafraid to go out of the state to accept these offers and take these chances yeah, definitely. And so I that is definitely, you're talking about the Arab community, the Indian <laughs> community is the same way. <laughs> I totally understand. Um, yes, because we are all doctors and engineers. So <laughs> there is no real like, 
idea of even being a journalist to begin with, just generally, and then especially in TV, it was like, my grandma was like, oh, are you sure you just don't want to go back to school? Do you want to go to grad school? <laughs> I was like, no, this is what I want to do. So, Most um, way possible. <laughs> <you know>? No. <laughs> Maybe if she just goes back to school, she'll change her mind. Um, <laughs> So I did get that. Uh, it was helpful to have my mom, obviously, like at least one person who kind of stood behind me. Yeah. Um, my dad took a little bit of convincing, I think, early on. He just kind of didn't get it. Um, but then when he saw, even in college, when he saw me get awards for some of my stories and being published in newspapers, then he like really saw, he was like, okay, like she's really into it. She's pursuing it seriously. And like, he was all in at that point. Um, but I did, yeah, get it from the community and I did get it from, um, I guess just like, even when you're navigating as a Muslim woman, right? When you're talking to prospects for marriage, like that's when you get it, I think the most because people don't understand and they think like, okay, but once she's married, once she has kids, she's going to stop, right? So, like, <laughs> so, you know, she's going to stay home. And, um, and for me, that was like, probably the most um, sticky situations that I have in, And I'd have to like, be very diplomatic and say, no, I worked my whole life for this. And I'm not going to necessarily like, it's something I would want to talk about with my husband, but does it necessarily mean that as soon as I have a kid I'm I'm done with my career I'm sorry mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I want to be a mom I do and inshallah I still will but like it doesn't mean you have to be one or the other mm -hmm. so um and that's coming from a working household my both my parents work so I have that work ethic in me and so that was definitely um something that I had to navigate around and when it came time to accept a position outside of like my hometown because I was living at home up until I left Chicago um I think at that point both my parents just knew that mm -hmm. like I had to take an opportunity and the good thing was that when I first moved it was to Iowa and it was only a two and a half hour drive from home so I used to come home on weekends a lot and they'd used to, they'd uh, come visit me as well and so I think that made them feel a lot better um for about moving out and like <laughs> just being on my own like you know yeah. you're not like my mom would call the time like do you need money I'm like no mom I work <laughs> I'm fine <laughs> oh, <she's so> cute. <laughs> you don't have food. to worry about me do you, want <laughs> food? Do you need to eat are you eating anything <laughs> exactly well, I can relate to you she moved out too to go to medical school <laughs> there you go yeah yeah. That's exactly the same, you know. That's exactly the same. They're always, and I love that too. It's like, sure, mom, yeah. if you want to cook for me, I'll take it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you never really grow out of that, I think. But it was, it was like hard, and of course they cried when I moved out, and it was like a very emotional moment. Mm -hmm. um, but alhamdulillah, they were supportive about it at that point because they knew how, uh, how hard I'd worked, and it had already been. When I say three years since I'd graduated college and had been applying everywhere. So, and I think also uh, I had almost been granted or uh, offered a job in Minot, North Dakota as a news reporter. So I think like they were really relieved that I wasn't going to North Dakota. <laughs> so this was like definitely a better option. So and then I ended up working out and it wasn't too far from home for like the first three years that I was out there. Um. Alhamdulillah. When you were in the job, did you ever face kind of like a story? I know you said that the stories are your own and you get to go out there and like choose what you were on to report on. Was there any any story that was particularly like difficult for you to do or your favorite story, I guess, to do in general? So my favorite story still to this day, and this, I'm in a new market now and like a new station, but I still think my favorite story is from my first station that I was at because it was, it really exemplifies what journalism is and like why you go into it. And it was this um, veteran who was on the verge of homelessness, basically. He was being kicked out of his apartment, facing eviction. Um, and he didn't know why management just told him, like, we're just deciding not to renew your lease. And they wouldn't give him any reason. 
when I called, they didn't give me any reason. And I told the story and subhanAllah, like I was in the studio fronting the story. So like live, and then I come downstairs and the phone was already ringing and it was someone who wanted to help. And so I got those calls and emails and like I had messages the next morning at the station for me too. And fast forward a week later and one um, state representative for Iowa had seen my story. She knew a friend who like helped people in emergencies, like get a deposit down, find an apartment to live. So she was working on that separately. A veterans group saw the story and they got like, a bunch of volunteers and a moving truck and everything. And this guy, this veteran called me and he was like crying and he was like, thank you so much. And they got everything taken care of. I'm moving to a new apartment next week. And like, I also got some friends, these veterans are taking me fishing. And I was like, Oh my God. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And it was just like, Oh my God, it was just such an amazing moment. And I was able to do a follow-up story and um, the day he moved. And I like documented about like how, how he was able to get his everything together. And I interviewed the people who were involved to help and things like that. And so that definitely was, is still my favorite story because of like, you don't get that all the time as a journalist, you try to tell every story and you hope that every story makes a difference, but you don't always know. So that was such a beautiful moment that I got to kind of see how that story ended. Moments like those kind of, make you also appreciate your continued like hard work to get into the field and to see like the fruits of your labors and the blessings, I guess, that you can also help people with, you know? So it's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, Get definitely. into the field and stay in the field. Was there any yeah. like, hardship staying in the field after? It's so amazing to hear your growth. Like you went from one station to another station. Is this, is this next station bigger than the last one? Yeah, much oh, bigger. Yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. It actually was pretty crazy because I was, um, I wanted, I knew that I wanted to go to a bigger market eventually. So for people outside the industry, you don't really know the rankings and stuff, but my uh, ranking in Iowa for that station was in a 98 market, I think, number 98. So that's pretty small. It's not like 150 small, but it's pretty small still. Um, and that's, that's rated by like audience and how many people watch and things like that, how big your area is. And so I'm in Austin now and Austin is like 35 or 36, something like that. Yeah. So alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a good jump. And, um, I'm in the number one station in the market, um, has the most viewers at all times. And so many like an award-winning team like they we just found out actually this weekend that we we're nominated for 16 emmys wow so, wow i know and i'm like <laughs> i can't believe i'm here like, <laughs> um i'm part of this team and i get to work with them and learn from them and that was my biggest thing is when i was leaving my last station first of all yes i was a little bit apprehensive that okay like these people put a Muslim hijabi on air, but what if no one else wants to, um, especially in a bigger market? And then two, I just wanted to be somewhere where I could just keep getting better as a journalist. I want, I literally, I don't shy away from telling people this, like even in job interviews or anything, like I want to be the best. Like whatever it takes to get there, I want to be the best journalist. And so um, I felt like, when in my interviews and stuff with the manager and the news director and whatever here and other reporters, I was like, I feel like they really know what they're doing. And they asked a lot of great questions. And they even like, when they looked at my reel or my montage of my stories, it seemed like they really were critiquing it, which I really liked. And like, that's what I wanted at my next station. I wanted people to tell me what I was doing well, but also mostly what I could improve. And so, um, that's why I took the job here. I got offered the position. And um, fun fact, I wasn't done with my contract at my old station. I actually still had a year left. Um, but luckily, we're sister stations. We're owned by the same company. So I was able to transfer. And, you know, it, it was an, an issue. So um, that worked out. And I, I'm glad it did, like you said, because you can, like, to show that you can continue that journey and like 
it wasn't a one-off. It wasn't a fluke. It was, it was something that was real that happened and inshallah will continue to happen because something that one of my mentors told me is like, he was like, you will always most likely be the first, like whatever market you go to, like no one in Texas wears a hijab on TV, like no one in Iowa did. And most likely that will keep continuing. So you just have to make sure you're aware of that, that like, that's a barrier that you have to keep breaking just because you broke it once doesn't mean it's done. So um, I'm glad Alhamdulillah, that I was able to, to break another one and inshallah that'll continue. Yeah. You can't imagine how much da'wah you're giving by having your hijab and standing up and like, you know, being in front of the, having people watch you in front of the TV. But I feel like not only that, I feel like you're an inspiration to also people of color. You know, like she made it up there then, so can I. So like, I don't have to change my hairstyle or my type or it's okay because I'm from a different background. So I feel like not only are you an inspiration to Muslim women, but also everybody else um, who feel like I won't make it because it's a specific um, image that people want to go to. Yeah. I also think it's nice on on the part of the media directors or the people that put these newscasters and these broadcasters in these situations to see, okay, we made that decision to put a hijabi on air and that didn't hurt us. So that bigger station would be like, oh, it didn't hurt them, so it won't hurt us. Because a lot of people are always apprehensive about something that's new. They're scared. They're like, if we put her on, we'll lose so much viewership, all our money is going to go away. And it's like to see that, that's not the case. That isn't the America that we're in. And that instead, maybe they even might have gained viewership over the years. And definitely a lot of support. I'm sure a lot of Muslims were out of their way, especially me, on to watch some of your news. That's so nice. And yeah, both of you guys make good points because um, Inada, when you're talking about just other people and people of color, I remember I was at a journal, I was speaking at a journalism conference um, last year, I think it was. And a, a young black woman came up to me and she was still in college and she said that the same thing. And she said, I know it's not the same thing, but like you persevering, wearing your headscarf makes me feel like I can wear my natural hair on air and still should be able to get a job in TV. And I was like, yeah, girl, yes, <laughs> but like you should be able to, <laughs> you should definitely pursue it and don't let that stop you. And I think that that's another thing that you're seeing in journalism or in TV news specifically is natural hair on air. Um, and I feel like that's part of the same movement and being able to uh, accept diversity, whatever it looks like in your market, because that's in the end what this is saying, right? This is saying that your newsroom should reflect America and America. And it's the way that the communities are comprised it's changed. It's not the same as it was 50 years ago. So you shouldn't have an all white newscast. You shouldn't have all white producers or talent on air. It should look like your community. And we are part of the community. We are right there. We're marching. We're doctors. We're, you know, part of the fabric of the community. And so, and then to Medium's point, I think it makes a huge difference also when they see that not only they make that jump, they make that leap, but they get a pat on the back for it, or they see the, the fruits of the labor on their end as well. And um, I actually, like, my parents were super worried about me coming to Texas, obviously, because I'm like, I'm Muslim in Texas, and, not <laughs> and um, I'm not going to go into like all the connotations, but I think you guys can figure it out. And so I, like, I definitely, that, that was a little bit of apprehension on my part, but like, alhamdulillah, I've gotten a lot of good feedback. And I did get like two, I think two emails of people who said that they like, didn't like the fact that I was on air. They said some mean things and I didn't see the emails. Actually, my news manager just called me and she said, hey, we got a couple of emails and I didn't think I needed to send them to you, but I want to make sure you know, so that like, you don't hear it from someone else. Um, but I handle it and I told them that we don't discriminate based on anything, whether that be gender, religion, and if they didn't like the channel, they could burn it. They had the freedom <laughs> to do so. And I was like, 
<laughs> and she was like, if you want me to say anything, I can. I was like, oh no, Haley, you got it. <laughs> and so, I'm sure it's so nice to receive that type of support from your higher ups. I mean, it definitely helps to know that. I, I mean, I feel like you kind of expected to get backlash going into this. You know, just going into TV in general, and especially as a hijab, you expected that not everybody was going to have be happy with it. But um, to speak to that, I think, is there any advice that you would like to give Muslim sisters that are struggling to try new things or just maybe some things that you wish you would have known before um, pursuing your career or just pursuing something out of the box in general? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um <laughs> So I think it's worth it to know, and I it it might sound like a little bit generic, but it's worth it to know that if you really care about whatever it is that you want to do, and it, I mean, it doesn't even have to apply to news or journalism or anything, but like if you feel passionate about something, and if you feel like you're good at it, and can get good at it even, um, and you have potential, you should pursue it, because that's that is what sometimes irritates me is if you know you feel like you have to go into something um and even on the other end if your parents or whoever the community thinks you have to do something but like Allah made us all with different talents you know he gave us all something that we're good at and we're not all good at the same thing and that's on purpose yeah. you know it's on purpose because we are meant to excel in everything in all different aspects and that needs to be encouraged. And I, I, I think that it makes sense. And I don't want to demean the position of our, our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents who came here, because it makes sense that you would want your children to do well and make good money and have a steady job, which means have, have a steady job in a steady career field, which is not journalism, <laughs> which is which is your more traditional route, right? Of being a doctor, a business owner, or something like that. And that makes a lot of sense. And I don't fault them for that at all. Like I would want the same for my children. But I think Muslims in, our, in America are at a point where we can expand. And we know how the industry works. We know how the media works. We know how politics work. We know how voting works. We should be out there. We should be ingrained in every one of those aspects, just as much as our other counterparts, our white counterparts. And we're, because I think there was a sense of hesitancy of um, kind of crossing over into these fields because you don't know much about it if you're an immigrant. You don't know how it works and you don't know how you'll feel accepted. But for us, I don't know about you guys, but like, I feel like 100% as American as anybody else. Like just because I'm wearing a hijab, just because I eat Indian food sometimes and like <laughs> dress in Indian dresses sometimes, like I definitely don't feel like that makes me any less American. And I feel entitled to every single aspect of our constitution, life, liberty, justice for all as anyone else. And so if you want to be president, you have a right to be president. So I'm like, just shoot for the stars. I think that, I think it's the time, you know, and we're, I'm so glad to be seeing that in so many aspects right now. And I think we can do so much more too. So that's, I guess, kind of advice. <laughs> Never give up. I did want to ask. So because you're the first, because you're kind of like the Togan, we have Tahira, like, do you feel any pressure because of that kind of status in terms of like what you do or the things that you say or what you wear, just all this kind of like, we have thought, you know, everybody's looking at you t for the example, like the base example. I, I did in the beginning a lot because I feel like the spotlight shone all of a sudden really brightly on me. <laughs> um, and I was just like, one minute I was just a, reporter or like producer or whatever and the next minute I was being flown to New York on the Megyn Kelly show and I was like what's happening <laughs> what is happening and so um it was all at once and I did feel that um especially because I made the mistake a lot in the beginning of reading all the social media comments mm. which you should not do ever <laughs> <laughs> like 
Um, and I remember one of the videos, I think it was one of the, um, I can't remember, it was one of the international brands, like one of those digital brands. Mm-hmm. And it was like so many comments. What, hurt, what cuts is not the comments from non-Muslim people necessarily, because you expect that, but it's from the Muslims. Mm-hmm. And it's from the people in your community. And I mean, these were people from all over the world, but they were saying stuff like, oh, she's wearing makeup. So that's, why does she call herself Muslim? Or like, <laughs> wearing <Wow. pants." laughs> or like, you know, and I was like, and I, the thing is, I don't even like, I'm most like 90% of the time don't even wear a turban. Like I wear like traditional hijab on air. Cause I don't want anyone to think I'm shying away from like my full Islamic, like, you know, <laughs> Uh, background or whatever and so it was like so that video was like me in like full attire and I was like come on man like how could you tell someone that they're not Muslim like even if someone prays zero of their prayers doesn't look Muslim at all doesn't go to the masjid doesn't fast whatever I would still never ever ever say that they're not Muslim because that is not for you to say that is never for you to say so Anyway, so that was like definitely in the beginning, I felt that pressure. Um, and I think my mom helped me in that a lot. And I think all moms are like this, right? They're your, <laughs> biggest, they're your biggest fans, but they're also your biggest uh, criticizers. <laughs> <laughs> and so she would like, she'd tell me like, okay, this person emailed you and well, she's my momager, by the way. I call her my mom. <laughs> like, she manages like all my speaking engagements and goes through my booking emails and stuff like that. So she'll tell me like, you know, you got this email. I want to let you know that it's harsh, but there is a little bit of truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> Moms are really like that. They'll tell you to your face, but then defend you to the rest of the world. <laughs> exactly. And that's, I feel like that's great. <laughs> and so, um, and so she's like, you know, there's always, you can always take some sort of good in it and like for the future and the way you carry yourself and move on. And so um, I think that's helped a lot where she's kind of like coached me through some of the criticisms I've gotten and you don't have to respond to every one of them. And I don't, and I don't, you know, sometimes, especially if it's just, you know, like this is America, like, you know, it's like, okay, well, I don't need to respond to telling that. Us so, where we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so that definitely was in the beginning. And uh, I talked about this actually recently on a panel with Amna Nawaz, who is um, an anchor at PBS NewsHour. And she talked about this as well, because she's the only South Asian, um, who, you know, who's kind of in her status right now. And it was funny, because she said that we do feel that like, it's the same for her. Like we feel that pressure. We feel like we're that token of representation, but you have to remember at the end of the day, at least for me, you're here for a reason. You're doing a job. And you, at the end of the day, what she said was, cause she was the first South Asian to moderate a presidential debate. Um, and this, this was this past year. And it's crazy to think that that's 2020, but <laughs> <laughs> it was saying that she got a lot of that, like from the Muslim community, from the South Asian community, like, why didn't you ask this question or that question? Like, you're a Muslim, you're Indian, you should be asking these questions. But at the end of the day, she felt comfortable, like I did the best I could. And inshallah, that helps, that helps in some way, I did some sort of good. And I think you have to remember that because there's no way you can win with everybody. Um, and so you have to just try your best. You have to keep a good moral compass and whoever that involves, whether it be family members, close friends, other allies, to make sure that you're grounded and on that path. That's all you really need. You don't have to take all the criticism from everybody else or unsolicited advice from people on the internet who don't even know you and you don't know them, you know, and you just have to kind of keep that focus. And that's day to day how I operate. I'm just like, I forget, like you forget. Cause it's like, you're, you have a de- I still have a deadline every day. I still like have to clean my apartment. I still have to go grocery <laughs> shopping, like, you know? So it's like, you don't think about that every day. And I'm just thinking about like, what's my story going to be today? How am I going to do it the best way possible? How am I going to get better? What's next? And then once in a while I step back and I remember like, the context of where I am but until then I just try to represent myself and I always make dua actually like every single day one of my go-to duas is 
for Allah to make me the best I can be, to help me get better and always represent Islam in the best way possible. And that is, I think, like, just encapsulates my goal in life. <laughs> it's just like to be the best and to represent Islam in the best way possible. And like when I get emails, like it's crazy because just in the last like month or so, I've gotten like three or four emails through my boss. People have been emailing my boss, telling him that they're enjoying watching me and my stories on TV. And I like, it's the best feeling because it's not just for me, but it's for like, the whole context of what this means for people after me. Like if he was hesitant to hire me, inshallah, he will never be hesitant to hire someone like me again. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel that the weight in those moments. And so like when John Smith emails my news director (laughs) saying that like, you have a lot of great, um, you know, like people in your news and weather department, but I want to let you know that we're especially enjoying Ms. Rahman's report. She always looks well composed and her reports are very clear and concise and I'm like that's talking about my journalism that's not even talking about oh we love to see diversity that's like you know about my work and I think that says a lot to obviously my news director who forwarded me the email and said amazing job like viewers are noticing great work and so I think that in those moments is when you kind of realize especially like okay yeah I'm doing the right thing. Like I'm focusing on my work and that's what matters. Not necessarily if someone thinks I should be wearing makeup or not. Speaking of your work, do you have like some sort of method and how you pick your stories and then how to remain unbiased or get at least like both sides or the full story? Usually when uh, you're finding your story, it's like literally whatever you can find. (laughs) That's interesting. Um, So it's the hardest part of the job, I tell people, because you have to come to the table every morning with your pitches with at least like two or three good ones. And that means like you've kind of vetted them already. You know, people are talking about them. They're interesting. You have to think about like, why would people care? Why do people care about the story? Because so many people reach out to you and say, like, I have this business or whatever. And like, I really like to be featured, but you're not a commercial. You're not a PSA, you're news. And so you have to think about how you can pitch the story so that you're not only your news director, your manager, but like your audience, like, why is this relevant? Why do they care about it? And so that's usually like every morning what I start with and then you just like go through Facebook and Twitter and like you know the um, different groups that people are in and then you know like the different public figures that are important so like the county judge here I always go to his Facebook page because he's always (laughs) posting something Um, and then I'll get an idea there and then I'll like try to find people who will talk about it and people who are concerned about certain things and so it's really just very community oriented community based and like You have to know what people care about around you and what they're asking about. And then you have to find answers for them or get answers or get justice or something for them. So it's a lot of work. If you think about like you have from like 9 a.m. to 4 o'clock because the newscast is at 5 and 6. So it's like you have to turn around really, really quickly. But that's generally how it works. So Tahira, not not only have you become a staple in media as one of the first full-time hijabi TV news reporters, but I feel like there's another side of your life that's also kind of a staple in our community, (laughs) um, both Arab and Indian communities, I'm sure. But um, we wanted to kind of touch onto something more personal. So why don't you tell us a little about your... um, marriage so we know not to sound like we're trying to be nosy or anything but um, (laughs) we know that you uh you have an interracial marriage and that's also that's something that's definitely out of the box for our community i think we've come a long way from where we were to where we are today but it's still something that's kind of a taboo topic in our community so can you I mean, congratulations on your marriage, inshallah, a lifetime of happiness. I mean, <laughs> I mean inshallah. And may you continue to be blessed um, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But can you kind of give us your story on that also? Sure, yeah. 
So, um, <laughs> I know I'll take where do I start? <laughs> um, long story short, Adam and I, we actually worked together at the station that I was in in Iowa. He started like a year after me. So I was already there as a producer. He's a sports reporter, actually. So um, he just came in. He's like this tall, jock looking guy. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, like, definitely not someone like, I mean, he was like funny and everything like that. And, um, but, you know, it was just like coworkers or, and, you know, nothing I ever thought of really. Um, and so then he like tried to get me, like he kept asking me to hang out and I was like, mm, <laughs> that doesn't work like that. And so I like definitely kept him at a distance for a very long time until I like figured out what he was trying to get at. And I was like, he's new here. So he doesn't have friends and maybe he just wants a friend, but like, I can't be that friend. I'm sorry. Cause I'm a Muslim girl and I don't do that. And so, um, so I think like that, that's how he like started trying to talk to me. And then he asked me a lot of questions about Islam actually. And like, like I had come back from a trip to Mexico with one of my best friends and, um, I had posted like some pictures from the trip, obviously. And like when we were on the beach and I was, I was obviously wearing like my long sleeve rash guard and like my <laughs> turban. And he was like, oh, interesting. Do you always wear that on the beach? And I was like, why is he asking me these questions? I was like, why is he asking me? These? So anyways, my friend Rachel like mentioned that he probably liked me. And I was like, oh, I never thought about that. But anyways, he started asking me more about Islam. And then I, I, basically was very straightforward with him and I was like hey I'm not sure if like sorry if you're not thinking this but like if you wanted to get to know me in that way like you'd have to be Muslim (laughs) and so um, I'm going to be real with you right now (laughs) I'm like just so you know nothing can happen unless you're Muslim so like just right off the bat letting you know that and so um I think that that helped because that made him look outside of me too into like what Islam was in general and like what that means to be Muslim because it's a lifestyle. It's oh. not just, it's not just you believe in this and that's fine. But, and especially like with the way I wanted things, like the more we talked and he talked to my family and I talked to his family I made it very clear and we were on this, made sure we were on the same page in that like, I don't want a hollow conversion. And like a lot of people, like I, I consulted um, my hometown imam in Naperville and he did say he was, and I asked him like, okay, if somebody converts for the sake of marriage, like, is that still a valid marriage? And he said, yes, and that's fine. You just have to make sure they have a good support system around them. But I like still didn't want that. I still wanted to make sure that it was he was in it, you know, into Islam before he converted, before we got married, before anything got any further. And so that's what took a while. And I, I you know, like it was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of me sending stuff to him or um, making like meetings and stuff, like uh, connections with other converts that I already knew, other talking to other interracial couples that we knew. Uh, One of my best friends, her, um, I grew up with her family and her sister happened to marry a black convert um, who also converted after they met. And so it was like a very, subhanAllah, like just before like Adam and I had met. So it was like a very good support system. And for us to like ask questions about even after marriage, how does this work? How do you, how do you, how are you a support for your spouse while also trying not to be overbearing and like push the religion down because it's like a kid, right? They're learning everything like you did when you were like five or six (laughs) and you, you forget what that's like, but it's a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff to remember. And it's kind of like, even today, like before you eat, like, Repeat after me, Allahumma barik lana. Yeah, you know, it's like it's starting it's, from scratch. Exactly, and so um, it can be overwhelming. And like, alhamdulillah, it's been good to like. We did a lot of like premarital counseling and like took a lot of quizzes to make sure like we knew what our priorities were. We did a lot of homework before making this decision, 
And like, even now we always like, I try to check in with Adam and like, Oh, what did you learn today? And like, <laughs> talk about it. Like, do you have any questions? And like, it's important to, for me to, to make sure that I'm not judgmental because for me, everything makes sense right off the bat. Like I yeah. grew up with this, like it makes sense why we don't drink. It makes sense. Well, why we don't eat pork. And sometimes you don't realize, but you like forget the reasoning behind what we do. And so when he asked me, I'm like, Oh, I actually don't remember. Like, I don't remember <laughs> what the reasoning is. You do it by like five habit. times a day. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so I have to remember that, like, not to be like, Oh, like, what do you mean? You just have to believe it. You know, it's a lot of like thoughtful conversations, deep conversations a lot. And, um, I like that we were able to establish that ahead of time. Like, cause he asked me a lot too. He was like, I don't want you to get upset if I struggle learning something or if I don't understand it fully. And I was like, honestly, I think, as long as you are always trying, I won't ever feel that way because what I think would just be upsetting and kind of like a no-go is like, I'm done. Like, I'm not even going to try, like, you know? Um, but as long as you are trying, because that's the same for me, for you, for anyone is like, whoever you marry, you don't always practice the exact same way. You don't see eye to eye on every single topic. And like, I, even within my family, like I have my, me and my mom and I both wear hijab. I have aunts who I love who don't wear hijab and like an aunt who like put it on, took it off, put it on, took it off again. Like it's across the spectrum. And I was like, as long as we understand each other and we can talk about it and communicate, I think I'm fine with that. And like, if you decide you don't want to eat the biha halal meat and I do, I think that's fine too. Like, yeah. It doesn't mean we, we can't get married. <laughs> so. It's interesting that you guys get the opportunity to have the, those types of conversations. Because I feel like when a lot of people go into a marriage, they just always assume that they're on the same, like, thinking level. And then once mm -hmm. they're married, and then they live with that, and they realize, what the heck? What did I marry? I thought we were on the same page. Here, <laughs> turns out you're on a different book. <laughs> <laughs> but have, so to be able to have those conversations and also it gives you know a chance to touch back to your own religion like because like you mentioned earlier we do things out of habit sometimes we forget the reasoning why Allah made these things and it takes you back to like it, and it happens when I'm meeting like um my Christian friends that also when they want to have a dialogue and I'm like I'm sure there's a reason I know <laughs> there's one I just never looked into it because yeah. this is my lifestyle. This is what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful that you get to have those types of conversations. I think that yeah, alhamdulillah. My man. Yeah, I think that's definitely been a positive for me and like his journey. And like even my parents said that they were just like, it'll be easier once you get married because you can help each other more. And like you, you're you, you'll be around each other twenty four seven almost and like it was hard when you're just still talking and you're not married yet because there's only so much you can do, you know, yeah. and it kind of like, Oh, I wish I could help you more, but I can't. And so it was a little difficult that way. And I think that was, that's why it was important for me to know like his full intentions and like his mindset before going into it, because that is what will like drive you forward, you know, in that, on that path is like, as long as, I'm open to it and as long as he's open to it then we can move forward yeah definitely I think it's um like Mariam had said it's really nice to hear you speaking about it also because oftentimes when you hear about interracial marriages or marrying sometimes it's something as simple as marrying outside of your culture just your community in general there's so much backlash and so much worry about oh there's going to be such a culture shock oh you're never going to see eye to eye so I think the fact that you keep that open, the communication very open and that, you know, you had that serious conversation with your parents and everybody was just at least open minded being accepting that it was really important, really um, special that you got to experience that. Alhamdulillah. Um, is there any advice you'd give to any of our sisters listening that would like to, that are interested in marrying outside of their culture or marrying new Muslims? I would guess that there are sisters out there yeah. <laughs> because 
<laughs> ever since like my first post um, from our Nika, I had like messages asking me questions about it. So <laughs> I would guess that there are people out there. I haven't been like very, I haven't decided how much I want to share. That's why I haven't like done a whole like, oh, what would you want to know or anything like that? Because it's still very much a work in progress, even for us. Yeah. It's like, alhamdulillah, we've been married for a few months now and like since May and like we've been solid, alhamdulillah. It's been so fun and so awesome. <laughs> um, um, but it still is a work in progress as far as our families and just making sure like, you know, it was – Hard for both families to accept, um, but easier for my family because it was converting, right? Yeah. So it's not much of a change for my family besides like this random white guy who's going to be the son-in-law <laughs> now. <laughs> but uh, other than that, you know, like he's Muslim and um, there's nothing for them to worry about necessarily. But like Adam's family, there was so much worry and fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And what that would mean. What does that mean when my brother converts or my son converts? Like, what will change? And that's still, like, Adam's dad is also a retired pastor. So he was, oh, wow. like, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I don't know how this happened. But, um, and it's just, and it's very, it was, I think it was very out of left field for them because he's very much this like all American red blooded male. Like he played football all through college and high school and like was did like basketball and baseball, like he, all these sports. And then like all of a sudden he like wants his parents to meet this Muslim girl that he wants to marry. It's like very, like he never like, you know, before he was Muslim when he dated, yeah. like all this, all white women, like, mm -hmm. you know, like not, not even a person of color. So like, this is very different. And so for like, for me, I feel like there was a lot of this. You don't ever imagine that you're going to go and marry into a family that is a little bit of afraid of accepting you. Mm -hmm. um, I always imagine that it would just be like, okay, two families into one, we're good. Like, you know, <laughs> um, no problems. And alhamdulillah, I feel like since being married and meeting them and like, being able to hang out with them more it's gotten it's smoothed over a lot and it's given them a little bit of um comfort to know that like adam is still the same person he doesn't drink and he doesn't eat pork and like we went to the cabin his family has a cabin in minnesota um that they meet at every summer and so we both went there and like we bought our own like beef bacon and our like <laughs> our Turkish sausage like halal sujuk and like you know we made breakfast for everyone with the halal stuff and like they were like oh this is so good and blah blah, blah. like this tastes just like regular bacon <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not that bad like you know um and so like we he's tested like every single non-alcoholic beer on the market now and he's like found one that he likes <laughs> you know like you know and he brought those to the cabin and people tried that and like his cousin made me like you know a virgin mocktail with like fruits and mint and stuff and so like it, I think when people see it when people see that you can live like and, and connect with people on a normal basis just because you have a different religion or whatever it's not that scary um and it's not that different you don't feel the difference unless you like specifically talk about it yeah and so um and like and it was really nice and I think it was nice for me to see that like Adam has hung out with my family so much and we pray together and everything but it was nice for me to see that even with his family we felt comfortable enough to go to the room and like pray on time and get up for together and like you know just I just saw how our world could mesh and like how an interracial, interreligious family can work. Um, and it, it calmed a lot of that anxiety and fear, even for me, just with time and with being with everyone. And so long story short, to answer your question, um, I think the advice I would give is that always like keep Allah first and foremost as your guiding compass and like we prayed, both of us prayed Issachara and like made that dua almost every night before 
we decided to even do our nikah. And I think that helps a lot. Even if you were, like, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be scared. It's not, it doesn't yeah. mean you're not going to have any fear, but at least you know that whatever happens will happen because it's meant to. Like, I prayed on this, and inshallah, this, my choice will be blessed. And so that's kind of what both of us stepped into this with our mindset of, and that's what I would advise everyone to keep in mind, and like, make sure your hands are clear and pure, and don't get frustrated along the way. Like, there, it will be so hard at some points, and you will cry, and you will think, like, maybe it shouldn't be this hard to get married to someone. Um, but inshallah, if like, just remember that like whatever is meant to be will never be able to escape you. And whatever is not meant for you, you will never be able to get your hands on it. So just like do your best and leave the rest to God. It's kind of funny to see the parallels in your journalism story and your marriage story, how there's like, <laughs> I needed to break down these walls. We needed to try this out sometimes. <laughs> like, you, you kept at it. You, yeah, oh I feel God. like, Michelle, you're always trying to push the limit and break boundaries. And it's like, <laughs> it's like exciting to see what else, what's next. It's yeah. so funny because it was like not something I ever thought of. And so it was really crazy that it was just like, okay, seriously, again, this is where I'm at now. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. It was like, this is seriously like the recurring theme of my life. It's crazy. <laughs> but, but alhamdulillah, that's what I tell people is just like, time and time again like even with Adam it's like you know when he gets frustrated like he looked for a new job as soon as he got down here to in, in Texas um and he, there's a lot of frustration with that job search and I was like trust me like I've been there <laughs> and like it, it, it's so hard to say it when you're not going through it but like if you just you just have to have that faith and he was like because he's like I don't get it like I don't get how you do it because it is so overwhelming and you just feel defeated. It's, that's like the best way you can put it. You just feel defeated. Especially like, when you feel like you're running at full capacity, but staying at the same spot, exactly. not by your own choices, but by the choices of others for you. I can exactly. definitely see how that just, that would break a person. I don't know. It's crazy. Exactly. And I just, you just have to remember that like you can plan and plan, but Allah is the best of planners. And I like tell them, I'm like, Dude, if I got on air right when I wanted to, like, I would have been really bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, so it's, it's, it, 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 there was wisdom behind that path. And I think for me to get on air five years after college was, uh, there was wisdom in it because I stood up to, I could stand up to the scrutiny, you know, and I, I was more professional and I was, you're just better with experience. And so I felt like I was, I had a leg to stand on at that point. And people weren't like, oh, she's just on TV because they wanted to put somebody different on air. They were like, oh no, she's on TV because she's a good journalist. And so alhamdulillah, I feel like that's the wisdom. And I told everyone, I was like, you don't see that obviously at the time. You're yeah. just like, this, this is the worst. But then, <laughs> you know, you end up, sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't, but there's always benefit in the path that, Allah chooses for you. I can personally say from my own experience, Tahira, I had heard about your on-air debut, but I personally never looked too much into the story. I was just proud that a hijabi did something different, of course. Just like I hope everybody else is just as proud. But honestly, after do recording this episode with you and being here with you today, I can say I'm so, so incredibly proud of your stories. I think you're a great person. I think you're a great inspiration. And... Um, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to shower you with his blessings and his mercy, birth, both in your career and in your marriage. Um, may you overcome all obstacles in your way and inshallah continue to be as successful as you are. On behalf of the Modern Skeptics, I would love to thank you for joining us today. We had a blast recording with you. I hope you had just as much fun recording with us today. Definitely. Um, for all our listeners, thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of To Whom It May Concern. Make sure that you're subscribing to our YouTube channel so you're notified when we drop new episodes. And make sure to give this episode a thumbs up for the great content Tahira shared with us today. If you don't already follow us, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at The Modern Skeps. And if you ever have any ideas you'd like us to speak about, please feel free to email us at themodernskeptics at gmail.com. Sincerely, The Modern Skeptics. P.S. 
continue to always pursue your dreams.